This Weekend Post, I'm answering your questions about On One Photo and Luminar. Hi everyone, I'm Scott Davenport. Welcome to InPost. So I've been long overdue to do a Q&A episode about some processing questions that have been coming in over the last, oh, it's probably a couple of months now. Uh, the good news is anybody that's sent in a question, I've given you an answer already, but I've taken a few, put them together here, and uh, want to share the uh, these questions because I think they uh, are applicable to a lot of photographers. Before I get into them, if you have questions, I'd like to hear from you. You can reach out to me directly through my website. You can leave comments on the video below, uh, Twitter, Instagram, and a lot of different places. I'm sure that you can find me if you look even just slightly beyond this YouTube video. With that, let's get to the first question. My first question was from Walt, and he asked a question about Luminar. And when does it make sense to use a filter mask versus a layer mask? Well, let's um, let's step that back a little bit and make sure we understand what the difference is. So I've got this photo here in Luminar. Now, a layer mask is something that we do on the layer itself. And what that means is all of the filters that are applied in that layer are either masked away or uh, in. And so just an example of that, let's grab a masking brush. You can see this orange box around the layer. And if I just do something like, you know, make a happy face, you can see where I've got differences in tone. And I can show that's my mask, right? Let's make that a little bit bigger so we can certainly see some of the differences in the sky tones. You can see here there's a lot more color, a lot more definition. And outside of that mask, it's pretty dull. So I'm affecting all of the layers. What a filter mask is, let's uh, let's delete that whole thing, forget about it. And actually, let's just do this. Go here and right click and delete the entire mask. Okay, so all of our filters are affected here. Now um, for this photo, uh, this actually is a good example of when I would use just a, a filter mask. Uh, let me add a sharpening filter. Sharpening. Okay, so here's our sharpening filter. I only want to sharpen the edge of this wave, so I can grab the masking brush. Now, right now, layer is activated, right? I want just the sharpening filter. So now that I have this orange box around here, notice at the top it says mask sharpening. I'm sharpening on, or sorry, I'm masking on just that sharpening layer. Now, here I can click delete removes the sharpening. You notice the big black mask down here. And then when I paint in, and let's do it at 100% so we can really see it, I'm gonna see, you're gonna see sharpening just on the edge of that wave, right? So kind of sweeping it through there. That mask is only on the sharpening filter. And so we'll go back to that and we can see, watch the front of the wave before, after, probably kind of subtle for the video. But that's the difference between a filter mask and a layer mask. So when do you use each one or is one better than the other? Oh, there's no better or worse. It really just depends on what you want to accomplish. And so um, if you're unsure, the simplest thing or the, like the foolproof way is create a new layer, a new adjustment layer, add whatever adjustment you want to make, new filter and so forth, and then mask at the layer. You might end up with more layers in your photo than you might quote unquote need, but you'll always get the mask the way that you want it. Um, it's uh, the way I tend to use it is um, if I know I have a series of filters that I'm going to take all the, the sum total of the effects of those and apply them in selected areas. I'll put those filters on a new layer and use a layer mask. For the photo example here, I only wanted to do masking on one filter. I'll use a filter mask or maybe two filters. I can quickly copy and paste the mask. Uh, an example of using a layer mask might be a texture. That's a really good example of doing it. Or uh, if I wanted to say desaturate and slightly soften areas of a photo to create some depth or to just change the mood of certain areas. I might add a uh, black and white filter or uh, a saturation filter I'm desaturating and a blur filter to slightly soften things. I could put all of those on the same layer and then use a layer mask so I could just put those on the selected areas. So that's the, that's the rundown of filter masks versus layer masks and I hope this helps you out.
The next question is from Ramona about On One Photo and the On One Photo browser cache and how large should it be set? Well, let's talk about what the browser cache is. So in On One Photo, over here, I'm going to click this gear thing. I'm in the browse module and we're going to see the preferences come up. And in files, not in files, in system, we have this browse cache size. And by default, it's 5,000. So what does this thing do? Well, when you're browsing through your photos in On One Photo Raw, you're getting a quick preview of them. It's, it's nearly instantaneous. But of course, on one smart piece of software, it will keep that preview it just generated in a cache because you probably are going to be working with a certain set of photos and you want to have that refresh as quickly as possible. That's where the browser cache comes in. By default, it's five uh, gigabytes. I tend to increase it up to about you know seven or eight. There's no reason to go all the way to 10 unless you're going to be working with a large set. And I guess that's really kind of how the advice comes into where to set this. What's your normal working set of photos? When you sit down to do a session of processing, how many photos are you working with at a time? Uh, and my style of shooting, if I have a couple of hundred, that's a lot. Uh, I'm usually not working with that many. I've already, you know, I'm not a prolific shooter. So for any given shoot, I've done maybe 100 photos, maybe 70. And of those, there might only be 10 that I really want to do work on. So I've filtered those down and my working set is small. Now, if you're a sports shooter or you're doing uh, weddings, I guess the first question I would ask is, why are you watching my channel? Because I'm a landscape guy, but hey, thanks for coming along. And then you would want to increase your cache size. So something, you know, you, know, you, can, go, you can go as high as, as 10 gigabytes. And then you have more space in the browser cache to hold those generated previews. Last thing I'll point out is you can also set where that needs to be. You can move the default folder. A default folder is going to be sitting most likely on the same drive that you boot from. That's usually the default. But if you have a high speed drive that you want to put like a solid state where you want to put your previews on, they'll be even snappier. Or if anything, you just want to get them off of, uh, say, your laptop. If you're working on your laptop and that has a, a finite amount of space, but your image in your library is on an external drive, you can move the location of that cache as well. So I hope that demystifies a bit about what the browse cache is in On One. The last question for today is from Simon. He asked about tips for using the perfect eraser in On One Photo. So, uh, the, the tip is to be persistent, really. That is the fundamental thing. And uh, if you can do a bit of divide and conquer with your erases, that helps. Uh, let me show you a bit of an example here with this photo of uh, some bicycles here. Uh, I'm going to choose the perfect eraser. And what the perfect eraser is, is it's content aware fill, right? You know, if you're familiar with that Photoshop term. So I've got my brush here and things that are easy, like this rock that's down here, now those are a single click. I click once, the tool will look around and then it will just fill in blank dirt, right? Easy, no problem there. Uh, when you have something else, like let's say we wanted to try to remove these tree branches. Uh, you may need to do more than one stroke. Let's try dragging right along this first branch and see how well it finds that line of grass and sidewalk and fills that in. That's actually pretty good, right? Now, let me undo that, and let's see if I'd gotten more aggressive and wanted to remove more of that branch in the same time. So I'm gonna do that same stroke, but this time I'm like, yeah, I want this gone, and I want this out of here, and I want this gone, and I want that gone. I really want this to be, you know, just really smoothed out. And now, let's see how well the tool does with this particular stroke. Okay. This is kind of what I'm talking about. It left some artifacts around. Did a pretty nice job at the grass line here, but it left these couple of smudges. And so that's where you'd come in and do a second, potentially a third brush through to clean up those things. And that's kind of how the eraser works is often you're having to do multiple brush strokes. Now there are certain types of removals that the perfect eraser isn't the best suited for. And especially if you have things with repeating patterns, like the object you want to remove is on top of something with a repeating pattern, you may have challenges with the eraser. 
That's where you turn to different tools, clone tool, potentially retouching, different opacities. I have an entire video course about removing distractions from photos, and uh, it talks about these topics in general, but I use the on one tools to illustrate how all of these different tools get used together to remove some pretty complicated and complex distracting elements from your photos. So Simon, I hope that helps out. I don't particularly have a tip of the week, but I, I guess I would say if you're doing any type of major distraction removal in your photos, expect to have to use multiple tools. And at the risk of sounding like a commercial, if you really, really want to get into it, check out my uh, course on how to remove distractions using a combination of retouch tools, cloning tools, content aware fill. You can do some amazing things. It's not uh, always a slam dunk and you have to work for it a little bit, but the results are really good. And that's going to do it for today's in post video. Hope you've enjoyed it. Again, if you've got questions, hit me up, contact through the website, comments on the video below. Any way you'd like to get a hold of me, I'd like to hear from you. And until next time, my name's Scott Davenport. Happy shooting. It's a Q&A episode of In Post. I am long, uh, long. I am long. <laughs>